This morning we're going to be picking back up in Genesis chapter 42. And we're not going to cover the whole thing this morning. We're going to cover the first 24 verses. Uh, as I was studying, I just realized we're not going to get even close to making it. <laughs> um, but the title of the message is, Why Do You Look at One Another? Why Do You Look at One Another? Genesis 42. Before we get started, I'm just going to reread those lyrics for those who might be listening from the song we just sang, Canvas and Clay. I think it really ties in well with everything that Joseph has gone through and going to go through. And At least this morning, I feel like it's kind of an anthem for what we're studying. But it says, In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you, before I took a breath. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. Do you think Joseph doubted it at all? You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. There's a healing light just beyond the clouds. Though I've walked through fire and I see clearly now, I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. And Lord, this morning, help us not doubt. God, where we've doubted you, forgive us. God, for the things we're still going through, or maybe we've just gotten through and we realize, man, we doubted you so much and we wish we did better. God, help us trust you more and trust you for deeper things, bigger things, and know that literally, God, everything works together by your hand and your plan for our good. That God, there's nothing you don't allow in our lives that's not for good. And Lord, I know it's super easy to say that, but God, help us believe it, God, because you said it, and it's true. God, we love you, and we know and we trust that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. So previously, on Genesis, God and man, <laughs> Joseph had two dreams. Remember the sheaves of wheat, the sun, moon, and the stars? I was really blessed that Mia remembered the sun, moon, and stars, and Jacob remembered the sheaves of wheat when I asked them before they did the coloring pages. But we also remember that his brothers hated him. There was half-brothers from the different wives of Jacob. And there was this plot to kill him. And if you remember, he was saved by Reuben. He was sold by Judah. Judah had the bright idea to, oh, well, let's not kill him. Let's make some money off him. And he'll be just as good as dead to us. And we'll line our pockets for, a week, for the weekend. Remember that he went to Potiphar's house, to prison, and to Pharaoh. That's my P alliteration, Potiphar, prison, and Pharaoh. And we remember the, the years of plenty and the years of famine that God gave that dream to Pharaoh. And Joseph was the one, after all those years, to interpret the dream of the most powerful man on earth at that time. And they had gone through the years of plenty. Joseph had been raised up. He had a wife. He had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, now the famine had begun, and people had begun to cry out, We're hungry. we got nothing left. Please open up the closet of food. But as we get started, it might be a little bit of a long intro. That's kind of when I realized this is not gonna, we're not going to get through it. But a few questions. And when I say your life, I mean you're in my life. So if I say your, I'm not trying to be like, this is your life. Because I certainly don't have it all together. April can attest. Maybe she thought it before she came to stay with us. Maybe she thought it before she came out here. And then she gets me and goes, well, well, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> this guy really doesn't have it together. My wife's known that for a long time. <laughs> and she still loves me. That's why she married me. But sincerely, does your life, do our lives feel like they're in years of plenty or years of famine? I know I write these questions and I know they're good, but part of me goes, oh, that's a little cheesy. But sincerely, is it a year of plenty or a year of famine for you? There's been times I remember, wow, I just kept getting paychecks and kept getting money. There's other times I felt like no matter how much I make, it's more is going out the door or I can't make anything and I'm out of a job and I can't even find work. But how are you and I measuring that harvest? How are you and I determining what is a famine and what is a feast in our lives? What is the method? You know, you go to McDonald's and they forget your sauce and you're too tired and busy to go back and get it, it kind of feels like a little bit of famine. <laughs> Some of us could use a little more famine in our lives, right? And sometimes 
maybe you got on the prices right like we've watched with our kids and you spun a dollar and you got the one dollar bid and you got up there and it feels like a feast but you forget that you have to pay taxes on all those prizes so is it really but really physically or spiritually where are we looking do we consider it a windfall when we have a physical blessing but a spiritual famine because physical plenty can lead it doesn't always we look at the bible you know there are rich guys in the bible solomon david abraham job these guys had money we see them handle it in different ways of course but there's definitely this feeling in christianity that you have to be poor that you're rich but the bible is clear that there are pitfalls to these and that you know the rich man's glory fades so i'm not going to get into all that but i think more often than not having all our needs met can lead to things like this like it says in revelation 3 17 because you say i am rich have become wealthy this is jesus speaking to the church and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable poor blind and naked that those people who has all their physical needs net needs met don't even realize that they are spiritually naked spiritually starving to death and spiritual famine will lead to, to physical destruction. That's part of why I'm so, I don't want to say scared, but so like the ship is going down for America because we've been in a spiritual famine and it's obvious that we're hungry. In Hosea 4, 6, the first part says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When the church and when the believers don't know how and don't know what God is about and what the Bible actually says, that's a famine. And when the people who are supposed to know what God says don't know what, it, what he says, of course it's going to be destruction because if the light you have is truly darkness, how deep that darkness is, Jesus says. And with that, do we have crops of our own, spiritually or physically, or, or do we rely on other people? You know, I went to Walmart on Thursday, right? And I guess I thought it was Tuesday because I was talking to one of the stock guys about how they had no food. And I'm like, oh, I normally come here on Thursday, so this is why. And I, I was like two hours later, I'm like, it is Thursday. He must think, like, like, I don't even know if he knew it was Thursday because he didn't correct me. Um, but there was nothing on the shelves. One of them was just because they're moving stuff around and the yogurt was no longer there. They put it over there. So I found it. But other things, there was like you no know, orange juice or, you know, the wheat thins Ashley wanted. They didn't have any. Uh, some of the produce was gone. Some other things that's uh, almost... It reminds me of sometimes in the winter when there's a bad storm and the trucks can't make it out here, there's a little bit of a want. And, you know, they always get here, but you have to think, what if they did it? How quickly would it be before we're, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think of the dependence that, that, that we have on other things. And that's part of that's a blessing that we haven't had to, to live hand to mouth for so long. But part of it's dangerous. You know, we see China, the tariffs, apparently farmers are, are complaining because there's a trade war right now going on with China. It's really a cold war with China and Russia that we're in right now and Iran uh, and a little bit North Korea, but um, this cold war for World War III. Uh, revelation, can't wait to get there. But sincerely, the farmers are crying out like, this is not good for us because they buy so much of our food. And yet I read other parts in the news, how we're buying all this food from South America and other countries. And it's like, how come we're not buying our own farmers food how come we're so dependent on this nation that has ideals in some way that are so counter to ours goals that are so counter to ours Elon Musk comes out and says China is really the future it is the future they have all these people their economy is growing and taking off they have power we're gladly giving our power away think about it America is it continues on this path is not going to be as powerful as it was once these things that we take for granted, these things that we think are always going to be there, may, may not always be there. I'm not saying they won't. Things can change. Things can happen. But I'm saying all these things we take for granted, maybe we shouldn't take for granted so much. Maybe we should change our dependence. But more important than physical food, if you could think there was something more important than physical food, I don't know that I could think of something more important than physical food than if my kids were crying because they were hungry. I don't know that I could think that. But where does our main sustenance come from? 
Is it physical food or spiritual food? And if we do agree that it should be spiritual food, where do we get our spiritual food from? Does it come from our own time with the Lord? Well, it should. Or are we just gleaning off others who are on the way? Hey, you came back from church today. What did you hear? I was busy taking a nap watching golf. And I get it. You can't always make church. There's other things that come up. I'm not saying, you know, if you miss one service or whatever, or you work on Sunday, you're in trouble. But what I'm saying is, I hope you don't just get it from me. I was just talking with a pastor the other day. You know, there's only so much you're going to learn on Sunday. You probably don't even learn that much on Sunday. And I wanted to joke with him, but I didn't. I was going to say, well, especially if you come to where I teach, you're not going to learn that much. But sincerely, is it feeding you? Where you are at church should feed you. You should get something out of the message on Sunday, even if it's from a complete donkey like myself. Because God can use a donkey to speak, right? But is it coming from your own time with the Lord? Whatever I say or whatever the Lord might say through me, a miracle, should be echoing what he's already speaking to you about. Should be echoing what he's been ministering to you about. That's why I was so glad to hear a few things from another pastor in a message I heard recently over and over because I feel like it's this is the stuff I feel like Lord's been putting on my heart. I'm going, no, Lord, this is too crazy. Is this is really me? This is out there. I'm not hearing this a lot. But it's... The more I read the scripture, the more I go, this is clearly evident, clearly seen. We need to feed ourselves. Timmy is so little, he doesn't need to know how to feed himself. He's going, ah, and mommy will feed him. That's great. And in some sense, we should be that way with the Lord. Go, ah, Lord, and do our devotionals. I was, I've been doing that the past couple of months, trust me. Look, trying to look for a house, and we're still, you know, thankfully, prayerfully running our contract right now, but it's still not guaranteed. Even if we get in there, it's not guaranteed. I could lose my job. Bank could come. Robbers from Idaho could come and take over the southern part of Montana. You know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But Timothy doesn't have to do it. He just cries out. And I go, eh, I've been crying out to the Lord like that. I can't take a nap because I'm so overwhelmed. Ah, Lord, please give me something. That's good. But I also need to feed myself. I'm an adult. You know, Ash, I, I have to admit it to you. I know how to cook food. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's nicer if someone else does it. I can sit on the couch, and my wife gladly makes me lunch. And I try and make it sometimes. She says, no, no. And I don't try that hard, so I suppose I could try harder, and eventually she would say, yes, go ahead. But I think you see what I'm getting at. That's one thing for a baby to cry out and need to be fed by someone else. But it's something totally different if you're an adult and you're not feeding yourself. Or even worse, you know how to feed yourself, and you don't. Because if we're not spending that time with him, if we're not spending that devotional time with him, sure, we'll come across something to eat. We're out in town, eh, I don't want to go home, eh, there's McDonald's, I'll get it, sure. Eh, it'll hold you over today, you know, you might even enjoy it, but you start feeling sick from it. It's not going to sustain you in the right ways. And even more, it's never enough. It's never enough. You're never full. I mean, you might be full. It's like Chinese food. I can't wait to go on vacation. Oh, I, just, I just remember. I can go get Chinese food this week. I go to work. You know how that goes. Psalm 81.10, continue to what we read this morning. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But we have to open our mouths. God can't fill us if we don't open ourselves to him. I'll be honest, I've been praying this this summer. God, please, fill. I'm, I want to be open to what you want. Fill me. Show me what to do. Feed me. Because everything else in life is not feeding me. Deuteronomy 8, 2-3 says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you and to test you. To know what is in your heart, whether you should keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you, excuse me, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That God allows famine, God allows trial, God allows 40 years in the wilderness of wandering. Why? That you might know 
that you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Like a bird feeds its babies from mouth to mouth, so God will feed you straight from his mouth to your mouth if you open it wide. We need to depend on him. And sometimes we don't depend on him because we think we got it all together. God's been showing me things in my life lately where I thought I've had it all together, maybe in my own life. I, I've, I've known that there's things in my life I have no clue about. Those other things are going, wow, but really, I am like that. It's not fun. It's good. I'm glad it's going through. And in some sense, I want more of it. In other sense, it's like, <sighs> thought I'd come some, some distance, but I haven't. But you know what? It shows me that I need him more and more. And that I love. Let's pick it up. Let's read the first five verses together this morning. Genesis 42. It says, When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. It says that Jacob found out about the grain in Egypt. So Jacob's an old guy. He was old to begin with, right? And then his sons have grown up. Many decades have passed, so he's really old. But word has spread so much that even old Jacob, who probably doesn't get out much, knows that there is food and grain all the way down in Egypt. And so his sons are hanging out, and maybe he comes wheeling out, I don't know, on a camel, I don't know what they use. <laughs> but he goes, what are you guys doing? Why are you standing around here? And why did it take him so long for him to find out? His sons weren't old, his sons weren't invalid, his sons were in the know, they were adults, they were capable of taking care of each other and supposed to be responsible. And so Jacob basically says to them, what are you doing? Guys, sons, I, there's times I, I walk in on my kids, I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, huh? <laughs> but they're little. They're having fun. They're doing kid things. They just, you know, get out, out of control as kids do. But these are grown men. They're, they have families. They have children. And they don't have any food. And they're not doing anything about it. They've probably exhausted. They've, they've gone to the grocery store. They've tried to do everything they can in town. And they know there's food in Egypt, but they haven't packed their bags yet. Guys, what are you doing? I think about our culture. and <laughs> So many people are supposed to be adults. And you haven't moved out yet? <laughs> you haven't gotten a job yet? Or even worse, you're married and have kids and you're not doing something to take care of them? Remember, this has been going on for at least a few years. This famine's not new. These guys are not children. They're not teenagers where this behavior is expected. And they're standing around looking at one another. I think they were looking. You go. I don't want to go. You go. And I don't know that it was irresponsibility that was keeping them back, although I do see that that could be a thing. I think this because they knew Joseph was in Egypt. They were remembering 20 years ago they sold their brother. There's a famine. Oh, we got to go down there. They have to confront their past. They have to deal with their guilt. That's a long walk. So we're going to find out a little bit later. That's where they sold their brother and now they have to go just to live. They sold their brother to die down in Egypt and now the last place that they have to go is Egypt if they want to live. I believe their guilt and their shame in some way was preventing them from getting anything to eat in that famine. You think about people who are caught up in drugs or other things or they're stuck and the answer is right in front of them but they can't because they're trapped. Just get up and go. 
Think about people who come to church. Maybe they're even open to the gospel. Maybe even they recognize their need for Jesus. But they let their sin stay between them and God. There's this guilt, this shame over what they've done maybe 20 years ago. Maybe they lived a great life, but they did one thing that they regret and they know is so bad and they've buried so deep that the enemy uh, uh, uses it and they allow it to keep them from coming to the answer that will free them. I've heard things said like, well, the walls will fall on me. Or everyone is they're so good. I'm just going to stand out. I'm, you know, I don't fit in. Maybe they haven't said that, but it's clear that's what they mean. That even though the conviction is cutting them, God is allowing something sharp in their lives to get their attention, they still won't come because they're bound in their, their sin and their shame and their guilt by the enemy. But what did we read earlier? God says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He doesn't say be a good person, get your life together, and then I'll give you a paycheck. He says, are you hungry? Come to me. Are you weary? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm lowly and gentle in heart. And John 6.37 says, All that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. They feel like they're going to be cast out. They feel like they're going to go all the way down there and somehow their, their sin, their guilt, their shame is going to kick them out. And heaven forbid we kick someone out of church, out of our lives who might be seeking God because of their sin. Now, a lot of people will take that statement and use it to say, let everybody in the church, they don't need to repent. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying someone who's broken and recognizes their need and maybe is stuck in sin and trapped in sin and wants a way out, we better not turn them away from the gospel. And Jacob says, go down to that place and buy grain for us that we may live and not die. We know Jacob has kind of been dramatic in his past. His, his whole life has been dramatic. But I don't think he's being dramatic here. I think Jacob is realizing and saying, guys, get up. We are going to die if you don't go down there and buy some bags of grain. I kind of feel that way. Babe, if you don't go to the store, we're going to die. <laughs> you know, is that going to hold us over to Tuesday <laughs> when I go to Walmart? But this famine has been raging, and perhaps is even the worst in recorded history at that time. We know Egypt was a superpower, and they were, the whole world was struck. They didn't have food. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Dust Bowl before. It's something I've, I've mentioned before, and I, I know a little about it. I'm not an expert on it, but it says, The Dust Bowl was the name given to the drought-stricken Southern Plains region of the United States, which suffered severe dust storms during a dry period in the 1930s. As high winds and choking dust swept the region from Texas to Nebraska, people and livestock were killed and crops failed across the entire region. Economic depression, coupled with extended drought, unusually high temperatures, poor agricultural practices, and the resulting wind that came about from all this contributed to making the Dust Bowl. So it wasn't just one factor. It was that there was a drought, they were overfarming the land, that there was also high temperatures that year. Um, but it says that the seeds of the Dust Bowl, which was in the 30s, may have been sowed during the early 1920s. So they were doing things in the 1920s, and they had this time of plenty, but their practices then helped sow the seeds for what would happen in the 30s. And here's a couple quotes. from This was from Woody Guthrie. I don't know who that is. But it says, On the 14th day of April 1935, there struck the worst of dust storms that ever filled the sky, from Oklahoma City to the Arizona line, Dakota and Nebraska to the lazy Rio Grande. It fell across our city like a curtain of black rolled down. We thought it was our judgment. We thought it was our doom. Can you imagine writing that? There's no food in America. After the 1920s, guys, the roaring 20s, stock market up, people dancing. It's after World War I. We think we just fought the last great war. We're partying. We're doing our own thing. We're out wishing there wasn't prohibition. We want to have alcohol everywhere we can. So they're having these wild parties. Franklin D. Roosevelt says, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. 
but their farming practices, they had over farmed the land. It had ruined the soil and made it dusty so that it couldn't support, that it blew away. That dust used to be good soil. What was now covering them and choking them used to feed them. Calvin Coolidge says, in the other periods of depression, it has always been possible to see some things that were solid and upon which you could base hope. But as I look about, I now see nothing to give ground to hope, nothing of man. I think Calvin Coolidge, I don't know if he was a believer or not, but he looked around and he said, with all our progress, with all our technology, with all we've come through the Industrial Revolution in the early 20th century, we've got no hope. Even if it did rain, the ground is ruined. This is from Karen Hess, Out of the Dust. It says, His mother is wishing her boy would come home. Lots of mothers wishing that these days, while their sons walk to California, where rain comes, and the color green doesn't seem like such a miracle, and hope rises daily like sap in the stem. I don't think California is such a hopeful place anymore with all the homelessness going on. But can you imagine walking from Oklahoma to California to get food? Because in California, when they saw green, it was normal. But to the man from Oklahoma, it's like, oh my goodness, something is growing. Like I said, there was a time of plenty in America, the 20s, that was followed by what? The Great Depression. This time of great plenty turned into time of great depression. And I just thought of it now, this meme I saw the other day that, uh, let me see if I can pull it up real quick because I don't want to butcher it. It's a meme, but it's, it's valid. I'm not just sharing, you know, a cat story, you know, falling off a chair or something. <laughs> uh, that's not it. It says, okay, here it is. It's like two guy, old guys in the library of books. It says, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Yet those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> thought that was good. And here we are in 2019, September 1st, 2019. Can you believe that, 2019? The world is so caught up worrying about physical fire. Fires in the Amazon. Guys, it's a forest fire. Happens every year. They're so concerned about global warming. Do we have any real proof? We're worried that there's too many cows passing gas, that we need to eat less meat to save the earth. Do you believe in dinosaurs? Dinosaurs tooted a lot more than cows did. But these things that may or may not even be real or have severe consequences, maybe it is real, maybe there's global warming, maybe it is the cows. Stinky cows. Maybe there will be severe consequences, but maybe not. And even if there is, it doesn't drive them to look at the real facts because they still willfully ignore the spiritual fire that is real, that is coming. We've read it. We've read, you read Revelation, you go, oh, that's the future. Yeah, it is to us, but in some sense, it's already happened from God's perspective that these things will happen. We are reading the future just like we read the past. And these people willfully ignore them on these things that have eternal consequence. So back to Jacob and his sons and these brothers, they finally listen to their father and they head down to Egypt. They walk from Oklahoma to California. Jerusalem to Cairo is roughly 460 miles. Assuming they're Jerusalem, they have to go to Cairo. If you and I had walked three miles per hour, that's average walking speed, and we walked for 10 hours a day, you walked that eight mile hike the other day, and you're like, woo, you know, and you hike a lot. But if you walk for 10 hours a day, it will take you over 15 days one way, assuming they came from Jerusalem and went to Cairo. You don't have much food, it's hot, it's desert, you're not walking in a garden, it's hilly, it's not a short trip. No wonder they are all standing around, I don't want to go. I don't want to California. There's got to be some other food here we're missing. I think more than that is because there's a lot of time to think. If you guys have taken road trips before, you know, it's a lot of time to think. I'm kidding. My family's all sleeping. It's night. I'm driving up a mountain with a trailer. A lot of time to think. And that road is straight and there's nothing for miles in Iowa. I like Iowa. There's a lot of time to think. 
And I think that God allows those times in our lives that force us to think when we can't do anything. <laughs> and we were talking the other day, we've got, you know, just, I've always got to be doing something. Even if I have a day off, I want to do something, whether it's a nap or whether it's work in the garage or take my kids for a hike. I'm a very have to do something person, but God allows those times to make us think. Gets us sick, hurts, hurts my back, allow me to hurt my back, you know, to make me think. But we see that Jacob was holding on tight to Benjamin, Rachel's other son. He had already, in his mind, lost Rachel, his loved ones, first son, Joseph. He's not going to let Benjamin go. He's more than a helicopter parent. He's not letting this kid go. You know, remember, she died giving birth to him. But these guys weren't the only ones. They weren't the only ones hungry. It was everyone. The whole world was going down to Egypt. When they got on the road down to Egypt, when they got on the interstate, everyone was going the same way. It's probably like one of the, well, it's probably both ways, but people were going one way to get Egypt to get grain, and everyone coming back was coming back from Egypt with grain. And I wonder what that atmosphere was like. I wonder what it was like on the road. I wonder if people were quiet, if they were somber. I wonder if there was road rage, you know. Your camel cut me off. I don't know. But I do remember this one story. Uh, it was shortly after 9-11. I think, it was with, I think it was within a year. I think it was the summer after, to be honest. I worked in New Jersey. No, 2003. This was like a year and a half after, or two years after, a year and a half. But there was a big power outage in New Jersey. It was towards the end of the work day, and we worked. We could actually see the city from where we worked. And where the power went out, and everyone was like, we're all looking out at the city, like, is it smoking again? There's power out there. Phones didn't work. We were looking around. We go outside. We're like, all right, let's just try and make it home. So we all go home. I go up. I start driving. Everyone's driving. Usually at rush hour, it's crazy. People are rushing. The lights aren't working. People are letting other people go. We still had 9-11 in our minds. Whole way home. No power from down by uh, Giant Stadium up to North Jersey where my friends were living, where I stayed. I got to my friend's house. They didn't have power. There's no power. We finally found a diner of all places in Suffer, New York, or was it Salisbury? Yeah, right off the throughway. That somehow this place had power, part of the grid, the way it interacted. But it didn't come on for hours. But the attitude was very different. Very different. I wonder what it was like for these guys walking the 460 potential miles. Verse 6 says. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. And then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, and they did not recognize him. And then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. You like my acting? I probably need to class, right? But send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, and your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. So he put them all together in, in prison three days. See that Joseph was in charge and he was directly in charge of day-to-day -day operations. Joseph was a man in all Egypt. That's quite the job. Everyone who comes to you for food and you got to vet every person. That's a lot. That's quite the bread line. But what do his brothers do when they see him? They bow down before him. And maybe if you've ever heard me the kids before, what are they bowing down before him for? Wheat. Can anyone remember Joseph's dreams? Joseph recognized them. Some 20 years have passed at this point. He was 17 when they sold him 
here. The famine started when Joseph was roughly 37. I don't think it just started. He's probably maybe 40 by this time. But they don't recognize him. But he recognized them. They looked the same, just older. I I remember what my brother and sister looked like in the 80s. They looked the same, but older. They don't, they don't look that old either. My family's got those genes, I guess. But to them, Joseph looks and sounds completely different. The language they don't understand, Egyptian, the language he wants to understand, he now speaks fluently and probably even has an accent. And I wonder, would people from our past recognize us now that we are believers? Do we look act and sound the same or completely different now that we're in charge of God's kingdom. In some ways, I hope so. In some ways, I hope they can see, the, see us and see a glimmer and see that there is a possibility for them to change too by the Lord. But in some ways, I don't know. I hope they can, especially if you've been walking 20 years. I mean, if, they, if you got saved last month, you're probably going to look very much the same. You might sound a little different, but probably going to look the same, but if you've been walking with the Lord for 20 plus years, I haven't gotten that far yet. Are you going to look any different? It says, then Joseph remembered the dreams. Can you believe the dreamer, the interpreter of dreams, didn't remember his dreams? Can you believe he hadn't thought about them? That they were long put away in his mind and heart, that he had not been thinking about those dreams, that even when he sees his brothers, he doesn't think about them. He's not sitting around wondering all day when these dreams are going to come true. Oh, Lord, when are my dreams coming true? Maybe he thought they were just dreams. Maybe God hadn't even interpreted these dreams to him. I don't know. Maybe just in captivity, he gave up on them and he buried them. He said, all right, I trust the Lord that he's going to do these things, but I just got to let him go. Man, don't let go of your dreams too early. I'm finding so often in life that as the trials come, as the pressures come, the words and the vision that God has given me, I tend to let go just too early. But if I were just to hang on for that last minute, if I'm just to drive around that last corner, even though the map says I'm there, drive around that last corner like I told you when I was in the woods, there it is. If I'd just gone a little bit further, I would have had exactly the dream that God had given me. You know, prayerfully, if this house comes through, it seems like it could be in some sense a dream come true. Is it perfect? No. Is it the most amazing thing to look at? No. But to me, it's got all these things, and to my wife, all these things that seem like dreams possibly coming true. It's going to take work. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take money. I don't know where that money's come from. But all these things seem like the seeds of the dreams are coming through. But if we had given up even just a week earlier... It wouldn't have been on the market. If we had really been wise in the world's eyes and just bought what we found a couple months ago, we never would have known. If we had kept looking in the same places we were looking, we could have missed out. And it has a, we're on a contract, things could still fall apart. But it seems like it's the Lord. But there have been so many other times in my life when I haven't waited, where I've waited for five minutes and I should have waited for six. If I just waited for six. But can you imagine all these things rushing back to Joseph? These feelings. He's going, he's going about his business. I don't know if you've ever been doing that in life. You're going about your business. And all of a sudden, someone from your past shows up. And it's this emotionally charged person from your past. And all of a sudden, it's like, your adrenaline rushes. Your emotions are going. Maybe it's someone you had a fight with. Maybe it's someone you're in love with. I don't know. And they show up. It's always at a weird time these things happen, guys. It's always at an interesting time. But the adrenaline, the trembling, perhaps in your soul or even in your hands. But he sees and recognizes them. He's at work. He's in the government. He sees his brothers and all these dreams from when he was a little boy come flooding back into his mind. He probably sees them feels them, smells them. The stars, the moon, the wheat. His coat, his brothers being sold. Bro, why are you doing this to me? No! Being chained and bonded. I think his countenance immediately changed. 
And he goes on to interrogate them. You are spies. You're not here for food. You're here to see what's wrong with Egypt and how you can take advantage of it. I don't think he's sinning. But I have a feeling he might be a little angry. And maybe I'm reading into it. I know that Solomon is always counted as wise, but I don't think Joseph gets enough credit for being a wise guy. I think he gets all the credit for interpreting dreams, even though that was God doing it. I think Joseph was a wise, wise man. And I'm sure that he's emotionally charged, but again, I get the sense it's much deeper for him that he's doing this, as we'll see, on purpose to test them. Because we will read later in Genesis 50 what he says. He wants to find out what they're really made of. Are they honest? And are they the same guys from 20 years ago that sold them up the river? Will they do the same thing? Because I think Joseph wants more than just to give them food. In fact, it's evident if you keep reading. But it takes famine. It takes hard times. It takes pressure. And sometimes maybe even accusation or persecution in our lives to see what we're really made of. And anytime God allows these things, it's not for him to see. He knows. He can see the depths of our hearts. No problem. It's always to show us and to show others. To my shame, I know that sometimes there's pressure on my life and I get angry. I get short and I go, "Um, this is what I'm really made of. You may think I'm a nice guy, but hang around me for a little while and you realize there's a lot to work on him. Sure, we we may follow Jesus, but when he is arrested, do we run? When it becomes against the law to be a Christian, when it becomes culturally inappropriate to put a verse in the bottom of your cup at your fast food restaurant, when a little girl maybe challenges our relationship with God in public, what do we do? If we remember Job, very wealthy guy, the enemy goes to God and wants permission to hurt him. God gives him permission for a season, but not to kill Job, but he can hurt everything else in his life. But you know what it did? It revealed that Job loved God. But if you read a little bit further, it, you see that Job has stuff in his heart that maybe he didn't realize. He thought maybe he was as wise or as smart as God. And God goes, Job, where were you when I made the earth? And then Job goes, okay, Lord, I accept even this trial from you. But you know what? God wasn't doing it to put his knuckles on Joseph's, I mean, Job's head. God was doing this because he wanted to bless Job two times over. And he could have blessed him over if he still had all these original blessings that maybe Job thought somehow he was good enough for. But Joseph says they are spies. And my guess is that this is punishable by death. You come into a country, you commit treason, it's punishable by death. And it would be hard to prove or disprove in some sense. But if Joseph is the number two guy in Egypt... He has the power to imprison him. Potiphar put him in prison for an accusation. He can put these guys in prison, no problem. There's not going to be any, you know, world UN court to come after them. Certainly not from Cana. When they have food, politics aren't there. Why do we not get certain prisoners out of prison? Because we know it means we'll have to go to war. And we don't want to go to war. And this person, to be honest, to the country is not worth it. They should be. But they say they are honest men. We're not spies. We're not spies. We're honest men. This word honest or true means right, just, and veritable. They are not lying. They are not there under false pretenses. They are there because they are hungry and dying. They are not spies. But are they honest? Are they true? Are they right and just? And if you read back a few chapters, their actions of several decades ago say they're not. But Joseph doesn't use his power and authority and that accusation to get revenge. Joseph got to Killed him right there. All these guys are my brothers. Take their heads off. You know what they did to me? Okay, Joseph, no problem. You got Pharaoh's ring. You can do what you want, boy. You know what he does? Doesn't seem like it, maybe to his brothers at the time, but he's using this as an opportunity to get all of his family back together and all of his family to Egypt. Maybe he doesn't realize that his dad is still alive. I don't know, but he wants his brothers, all the brothers there. I think Joseph loves his brothers no matter what they did to him. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. I need to take that into account. 
does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Joseph has endured a lot. And Joseph still has hope that there's something in his brothers that is different. Even though what they did to him 20 years ago. And he wants restoration. He wants his relationship back with his brothers. In some sense, he cares what they did, but only for the sense that, man, can he trust them? Can he allow them back into his life? If they're still the same conniving guys, he can't allow them here in Egypt. And I would hope that's what we want for our families. Whether they are severely broken like Joseph's, they've sold you up the river, they wanted you dead, or maybe they're just a little distant and things aren't as close as they used to be. You and I only get one family. Thankfully, we have, like, we have the church and we can be a family in church and that family in some sense can be stronger than a family that doesn't know the Lord. But in the same sense, they're still our brother, still our sister, still our mother and father. And they're the hardest ones to reach. Not only in just reaching them, but also sometimes wanting to reach because the hurt is so deep. But 1 Timothy 5 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, I'm not saying gloss over things, pretend like nothing happened. Joseph's not pretending like nothing happened. But make every effort to bring peace and salvation to your home, especially food. That's what the provision here is. But Joseph accuses them of wanting to find out the vulnerabilities of Egypt. You've come here to see the nakedness of Egypt. What's, what is Egypt not doing right? How can we sneak in here? How can we take advantage of it? Because that's what a spy does. A spy wants to find out all the secrets of a land. But it's interesting that he says that, I think, because when he opened up to them as a young man, he exposed his vulnerabilities to them. And they took full advantage of his trust in coming to him alone. Hey, brothers, dad sent me. Kill him. Put him in the pit. Sell him. He trusted them even though they hated him and they were mad at him. He kept trusting them because they were his big brothers. He loved them. They say one brother is no more and they meant him, Joseph. And I wonder if they thought he was really dead or were they just continuing the story? You know, Had they just accepted that he was dead to them because there was no way for them to track him down? Once he's sold, you're not finding him. There's no detectives. There's no GPS. There's no anything. Once someone's gone in that day and age, they're gone. I think in one sense that was good in a way, not that you could be gone. But that man, if someone wanted to start over in life, they wanted to turn over a new leaf, like you've ever seen Les Mis, you could get away, you could go somewhere else and no one would know your name. You could take a new name. I mean, there's risk in that because someone shows up and they pretend to be someone good. But I think in the same sense, like, man, someone just wants to get away and start over and start new, they have the opportunity. But now everything you do is coded in a computer and scored somewhere. Again, I wonder if they really thought he was dead. And I don't want to skip it, but <laughs> I, I, to be honest with you, I, I, have a, I have a struggle, and I don't want to mean like this is my struggle. Like, you know, before I came to the Lord and being in a relationship and getting pregnant and having an abortion, I struggle even saying that I miss the child and that they're even my child because how can I have that right to say these things? And I, I don't want any sympathy for it because I, there's no sympathy to be had. Um, but on the other hand, how can I not talk about it? If I love this child and, and how bad it was, how can I not say that it was wrong? How can I not say that, yeah, I've got four beautiful kids, but I have another one in heaven. And yeah, it opened up the cans of worms with them. Well, Dad, well, what were you doing in college? And who's this girl and what? And, and it opens up a can of worms for them to look at me and say, Dad, you did that to them. You must not love me. You don't know, the whole thing, but in the other hand, since the Bible says to speak up for those who don't have a voice, who can't speak for themselves, or are appointed to die. And I hope that it shows them the goodness and grace of God and how much more I, I do love them because God was gracious enough to give them to me. So I don't know if they, I don't know why they said he was dead. Maybe they just didn't want to get into it. But Joseph tests them by putting them in prison for three days. I don't know if he told them it was going to be three days, but it's three days. And I love how the Bible keeps using three days over and over in different stories like Jesus. But that's how long they were in there. And he was trying to examine, to prove them, to scrutinize them. And that's what he was doing here. And just like you might do for gold, or you heat it up, or a metal, and see what comes out of it. 
And that's what these trials are in our lives. They heat us up and to see what comes out of us and bring it to the surface. And 1 Peter 6, uh, 1, 6 through 9 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, you may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That these trials in life, is meant to bring us to the end of our faith. And what's the end of our faith? Not giving up, but having salvation, having complete faith that it's going to happen. He's torturing them. and He's doing it on purpose. He's not using physical torture. He's using mental torture and put them in a real survival situation. They were going to die by the famine before, but now they're certainly going to die if they can't prove to this guy that they're not spies. And I know we're going long, but I'm going to try and get through these last few pages so we have a good place to stop but it says in hebrews 6 13 through 16 for when god made a promise to abraham because he could swear by no one greater he swore by himself saying surely blessing i will bless you and multiplying i will multiply you and so after he had patiently endured he obtained the promise for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them the end of all disputes so joseph swearing by one greater by the life of pharaoh by the life of pharaoh but also that, you know, if these guys want to live, they need to endure this trial. And he tells them that he fears their God, Elohim, the plural God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he tells them he has a plan that they're going to leave their brother there. And if they really are changed men, they will go home and they will get their other brother and bring him back. If they really care about this brother in prison, they will come back. They didn't care about Joseph when they put him in the pit. They didn't care to chase after him and get him back. But if these guys are different and they do have brotherly love, excuse me, they will come back for him. And they want it. He wants them to bring Benjamin. I think partly, obviously, because he wants to see Benjamin. He wants to be reunited with them all. He wants to see his actual little baby brother. But I think also, would they care for their youngest? Would they care for the most vulnerable among their family? Joseph was young and vulnerable, and they didn't care for him. Do they care for those who need the most care? Who lost his mom? Who lost his brother? Who's all by himself? And this was the only way to prove it. And in life, we can't make demands of people in life. I mean, you know, sometimes you like want to test someone to see if you can trust them again, especially before the Lord, you put them through hazing. But the only way to know is to see what they're going to do. Not to put them to the test, but to watch as their life is tested and see if they are the right one. See if this is the right church to be in. See if it's the right friendship to be in. The right ministry. The right marriage. So often we don't wait for things to be tested before we put down our whole lives to purchase them. That's why we want to get a home inspection. Got to test it a little bit. I even had my friend look over the phone to make sure that before I even made an offer. But they begin to speak to each other about it. So picture the circumstance. They're in chains. They're, they're uh, just in prison. Joseph's going to make a determination this man before them, this power figure in Egypt, probably has guards around them. They're in chains. He's got all this pomp and circumstance. And here they are, these paupers begging for food. He says, I got a plan. And they turn to each other. And they go, what are we going to do? And Reuben is like, guys, I told you not to do this. I told you not to sell him. Look, it's coming back upon us. We're not getting away with it, guys. The sin is coming back upon us. And they see it as divine circumstance, divine punishment for what they did. That they thought they buried it, got away with it. They'd just been carrying the guilt. But no, it's finally caught up to them. And the consequences now are totally real and totally unavoidable. It's going to cost them a brother. It's going to cost them either Simeon, their lives, or Benjamin. Or maybe them all. Reuben, I told you not to harm the boy. Reuben's still guilty in it all. He's mad because he told him the right thing to do and he couldn't make them to do it, but he was still just as guilty because he couldn't save his brother. And they don't think Joseph can understand him. Remember, he's to them, he's a powerful Egyptian. But he sees this. He hears this. A clear window. He's speaking through an interpreter. There's some guy interpreting and they're speaking in Hebrew and he's understanding it. But he's faking it and letting the translator go. And he's probably going, you didn't get that right. But, you know, he's, he's maybe even answering questions that the interpreter hasn't even said. 
but he's got a clear window into their hearts and minds and souls of his brothers. God has given him clear view into the inner life of these men. And what does it do to Joseph? He breaks down. He begins to weep. He probably goes, he covers himself, goes in the other room, probably excuses himself. And he weeps uncontrollably. You know, there's been times in life, I'm sure all of us have weeped or wept over something. And what did Jesus do? It says that Jesus wept, right? When his friend, like a brother, had died. It says he talked to them after. I wonder what was said. I mean, I wonder, you know, obviously it came down to them choosing Simeon. I wonder if they chose him because he's the second oldest and Reuben was the oldest. And Reuben said, I'm not, it shouldn't be me. I told you guys not to do this. It's, pick Simeon. I don't, I don't know how the conversation went, but Simeon was it. But as we close here, we see the emotional depth of what's going on here. There's so much anguish, so much turmoil. It's all coming to a head right now. And it's all in the shadow of this horrible famine on the land, a land that's dying. It's overwhelming, to say the least, when you think about the personalities, the connections. The You know, people say the Bible's not real, but this is, this is real stuff. And even bigger than that, it was all part of God's plan to get Israel, like we said, to get Jacob and his family into Egypt to survive. They might not have survived if any of these things happened. I don't know how God does it. God obviously didn't like wake up one day and say, you know what, I'd love if Joseph were in prison. Wouldn't it be great if his brothers betrayed him and wanted to kill him? That's, that's, that's a holy plan, right, Jesus? No, that's not. But somehow God uses the sinful acts of people, even uses the works of the enemy, because he's all-powerful, omniscient, everywhere, and there's no getting anything by him, and he's super wise. He's the inventor of wisdom, after all. And he can still use it and orchestrate it because all things work together for our good, the Bible says. All things. I think we don't like that because it means that even the hardest things, even the most painful things that we wish didn't happen to us or we wish didn't do, that God says, I can use it. Satan's not going to get one over on me. Oh, he thinks he's doing that? Oh, i got to figure it out. And all to make Israel a nation. They would one day turn around, go back, and inherit that promised land that right now is full of famine, but one day will be flowing with milk and honey. What are you and I going through right now? What and where is your family going through or has gone through? What have they done to you and what have you done to them? Or what's just happened to you as a family? Could it be that God has a bigger plan for all of it? Not could it be. God does have a bigger plan for all of it. God has allowed all these things to happen for good. That the end of your faith would be your salvation. That the words, I like this line, it says that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you. We speak a lot of words as Christians. We speak a lot of words in life. Some of us speak more words than others, right? And the people who speak a lot of words don't understand this. People who speak a little words. And speak, people who speak a little words don't understand that people who speak a lot of words. It's just the, way, just the way it is. But is there any truth in them? The Bible says that by, uh, in many words, sin is not lacking. I'm not saying this. I'm not going to talk, but... I have to wonder, are our words just words when it comes to our family? Do we just say, I love you, because we say it, or do we truly mean it? And bigger than that, with the church, and our families, and in life, really, why do we look at one another? I know why you're looking at me, because it's already 59 minutes and 15 seconds, and I'm going long again, but why are we looking at one another? If, if we want to see... Healing in our family. We want to see healing in our church. Stop looking around and pointing the finger and saying, you guys got to do that better. And that's what you guys are doing wrong. And stay away from them. And if it's something, you know, I I think you guys can all take this with a grain of salt and understand how to rightfully apply it. But we need to start praying for each other. When something's going wrong, you pray. When something is messed up in your family and, and you see something going on, 
reach out, pray for them. Always start with prayer because then we'll be able to reach out effectively. But if we have a position of spiritual power in our families, let's not use it for destruction. Let's use it for restoration and redemption because it's such a great word and truth, resurrection. God, we thank you that, God, you never give up on us and that, God, you always have a plan and a purpose that even when we can't see and it's going to take many years, even those people come back in our lives and the emotions come flooding back and maybe it would even be right to exact revenge and we could get away with it and it would be totally within our power, even our worldly wisdom, to not do that, to seek restoration. God, we thank you for the Bible and what you're showing us in it. And God, we do pray for our families, our brothers, our sisters, our in-laws, our biological families, our families in the church, our families, just maybe they were close to us growing up. Whatever it is, God, bring healing, bring restoration in these families, whatever it takes. Use us, God. In the church, let there be restoration among the churches. God, we're all your church. Let there be a family in the church that people would come in these last days and see these people have been with Jesus because they love one another. Help us to love each other and not in some gushy way that overlooks the faults, but in a way that rightfully helps each other, rightfully feeds each other and cares for each other's needs. Spiritual and physical. We love you, God. We trust you with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.